Hello, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the 10th ILA Festival, the Irish, Spanish and Latin American Festival in Ireland, organized by the Cervantes Institute in association with the Latin American embassies here in Ireland and supported by Dublin UNESCO City of Literature. I'm your host for this evening, Olive Heffernan. I'm a Dublin based freelance science journalist who covers oceans and climate change. My work has appeared in many international publications such as Nature, Scientific American and Wired. I currently teach climate change communication at Johns Hopkins University and I'm writing my first book about the oceans. So this evening, however, it's my great pleasure to welcome the award winning Colombian American science journalist, educator and author Angela Posada Swafford. Over the past 30 years, Angela has written on all manner of science subjects covering topics from astrophysics and space to genetics, climate change, biodiversity, paleontology, you name it, for all sorts of amazing international publications. Um, Angela has been on many, many expeditions to Antarctica, and she has also communicated her work widely around the world um, to audiences who are both young and old in English and in Spanish. She has received many accolades for her work. Most notably, she has been the first Hispanic journalist to receive the Knight Fellowship in Science Journalism from MIT and Harvard. In 2017, she won the Simon Bolivar Award, which is Columbia's top journalism prize. And in 2018, she published her most recent book, Ice, Journal of an Antarctic Adventurer. So this evening, Angela is going to speak to us about a series of rock paintings that were discovered deep in the Colombian Amazon. She's going to talk to us about this incredible finding and what these ancient walls and their prehistoric artworks mean for us today. So it promises to be a fascinating discussion. But before we begin, um, let me thank the Embassy of Colombia here in Ireland for supporting this event. And let me tell you a little bit about the format of tonight's session. So, Angela will speak for approximately 30 minutes, after which I'll host a Q&A. Um, so let me remind you to just keep your microphones on mute during the conversation um, so that we can hear Angela clearly. Um, but if you want to ask a question in the Q&A, I'd ask you to just put it as a note in the chat. And if you want to ask it yourself, just put a note in the chat or raise your hand and we'll be able to assist you further. So without further ado, let me hand over to Angela. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's it's uh, really a pleasure to be able to talk to you guys in Ireland. Oh my God, uh, not the least because my grandfather had some Irish blood. So I really feel connected to your beautiful land. Um, thank you also to the embassy. And uh, I just love these international events. They connect us across cultures and across lands and across the biggest connector of all, which is the, the ocean. So yes, as, as Oli was mentioning, uh, I've been really fortunate to, to accompany researchers and to learn about uh, so many interesting um, investigations going on around the world. And being a Colombian living in Florida for a while, for well, actually for 30 years now, um, it kind of suddenly dawned on me, okay, here you go. Here you are covering Hawaiian volcanoes and uh, stuff in, uh, you know, in, in the United States and uh, the rest in Latin America, so many interesting things. But what about Colombia? So lately, uh, after the government signed the peace treaty a few years ago with the armed forces, there has been a phenomenon going on in the country, which is that uh, areas, vast areas of the country that used to be a no-no, an impossible dream uh, to visit for most of us Colombians suddenly are beginning to open for good and for bad. <laughs> for good because of course, uh, wow, I remember a few years ago when you said, oh, I so much would love to go to the Amazon uh, or to the Orinoco region or to this or that forest. I mean, uh, people will look at you, I, don't you dare. I mean, that's so dangerous. This is really, this is not 
not an, a, a sane idea. Now, uh, more and more tourists and visitors and researchers, lots of biologists and archaeologists are venturing into many of these areas, along with, of course, people who want to deforest, who want to clear cut uh, a lot of these transects of forests in order to have cattle growing and in order to just simple, simply just, you know, take, take over. Uh, it's when you look at the map of Colombia and I, in a way, I, should, I think we should have a, prepare some slides, but okay, I'll talk to you and then I'll show you a, a link to a great video for you guys to see the place we're going to talk about. When you look at the map of Colombia, a half of it is this kind of big green swath, of, especially to the southeast. Uh, and that is all, you know, forest, a lot of it impenetrable, a lot of it uh, virgin, a lot of it second forest, but it's not easy to get across. So this is one place called Chiribiquete, which if you open the, the chat, you will see how we pronounce it. Actually, we write it with a Q, we pronounce it with a K. Chiribiquete is an indigenous name for this amazing national park uh, that was um, is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it is uh, more than 4 million hectares. It's the largest uh, pretty much park in, in Colombia, and I think the almost in South America. Uh, and uh, it, was, it has been studied for the past 30 years by a very prominent archeologist in Colombia called Carlos Castaño, with whom I've been hanging around lately. He's an incredible person. Uh, but also it's been studied by um, another um, uh, archaeologist from the University of Exeter, precisely, uh, uh, Dr. Iria, Jose Iriarte. Um, but the thing is that this one place is, I don't know if you ever saw the movie Lost Horizons, <laughs> where a group of people just finally get to go into this weird, wonderful, unknown virgin territory and they find this perfect nature. This is what Chiribiquete is. It's picture a sea of uh, Amazon, impenetrable, thick, green. And uh, out from that sea, you see all these um, kind of flat top tabletops, flat top mountains emerging from it but up to a thousand meters high, each one of them. It's incredible. And so they, it's like islands in the forest and they have these flat, flat tops, uh, almost like glaciers in Antarctica, but they are green and rocky instead of white. And um, each one of those uh, formations, very old, they are called the puis, and they rest over a basement of rock, which is, around 1,800 million years old. It is a Precambrian rock, uh, which is among the oldest formations of the continent that used to be uh, tied to Africa is what, what is called the uh, Guiana Shield. Uh, and uh, these uh, rocks, well, then they are the base for this. So obviously imagine that each one of those kind of tabletop mountains pretty much holds a different biodiversity. We have not even begun to study, to scratch the surface of this incredible place. Uh, it's hard to get there. You have to pretty much go by helicopter if you want to land on this thing. You have to, um, yeah, you can go um, navigating through the myriads of rivers that crisscross it, but those rivers themselves are like <laughs> impenetrable too. Uh, so this, uh, 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 Archaeologist, Dr. Carlos Castaño, he used to be the National Park Director of Colombia years ago. And he, uh, for the past 30 years, he has, been, he has been trying to protect and to study this wonder when most of the Colombians didn't even know this thing exists because it is, again, hard to get to. Uh, but now uh, it so happens that with uh, the, the access and the situation security changing a bit, so this wonderful place that I'm going to tell you now about the rock art is being threatened and deforested. And I, I compare it to a map 
you know, that the, the, whose, whose borders are slowly being burnt. Uh, and, uh, and I just can't stand it. So um, Dr. Castaño and other uh, people in the Colombian government uh, want now to, to make known to the world that this place exists, whereas before the idea was to kind of keep it secret if you can actually keep secret such a big thing. But so now they are really engaged in, in, in this thing. Okay, let's, let's call the attention to protect it. So what is the thing? Not only you have this wonderful nature thing, but uh, Dr. Castaño and others discovered, especially, well, he actually was the first to see that uh, in, the, in, the rock, in the rock faces of these big mountains, the Puis, uh, at different heights, there were thousands upon thousands of, of uh, rock art paintings uh, painted with red uh, mineral um, ink. Um, I think it's ink, pig, uh, mineral and probably plant-based pigment, pigment. I'm not sure. They haven't even yet finished discovering that. The point is that this place was inhabited by a very ancient civilization, which is now being suspected gave rise to many of the civilizations adjacent to it. Because some of the paintings that you can see uh, in that rock art, and I'll tell you more about it now, uh, some of the motives and the patterns have also been seen in the Gold Museum of Colombia or in the existing tribes of Colombia have kind of, kind of, uh, Related, related uh, uh, motives to this. So, uh, what is being believed is that this was like considered like a very big, important shamanic place, like a center of the world for these indigenous tribes. Um, again, we're talking about uh, at least twenty thousand years old. So, these discoveries are pushing the habitation of the Americas. Uh, which was believed to be just like 13,000 or something like that years, is pushing this to a lot before, a lot, a long time before. So uh, this is interesting because just last month, there was a paper saying how in the United States, they just discovered uh, also evidence of population, um, early population also that dates back to 20,000 20, years ago. So this is all beginning to make sense, uh, or at least, so, so one could surmise. So these people uh, apparently use this impenetrable forest uh, in Chiribiquete to, as a canvas for their culture, as a canvas uh, for their, their religion, uh, and also as a canvas for the nature that they were seeing around them. Uh, what is interesting about these paintings is that they are not just painted like that on the bare rock. These people actually um, changed and prepared their rock walls as their canvas. They really polished them and put special uh, preparations so that they could contain the, the pigments of the paintings better. Um, they also left evidence of how they did this by you know, making big kind of staircases made of wood uh, to, to actually get to these very, very high uh, rock walls, and um, and what you see there is amazing. Uh, so far, discovered are seventy thousand murals or paintings, images, and there are many more to be discovered. Apparently, so these these they are just beginning to scratch the surface on what this all means. Uh, I am pretty sure you're gonna hear more about it uh, in the coming years. The one beautiful thing they they are talking about that now is uh, the fact that there are animals there being represented that show lots of en endemic animals of the region, of fish, birds, um, you know, the, the forest uh, animals with uh, at least eight orders or more of families of animals. There is a huge biodiversity. Some animals are the same as the modern animals. Some are not. Some are prehistoric animals. So the idea is what they are trying to figure out is up, up to what point did these primitive people cohabitated with these animals. And also there are lots of animal-men figures. 
anthropomorphic figures that obviously point at the fact that there, there was a lot of ritualism. And the main or the central figure, which is beautiful about this, is the jaguar, mm -hmm. the cat jaguar. Because these people, according to Dr. Castaño, were the, the, the sons and daughters of the son jaguar, which apparently is whom they consider this place because of their location uh, uh, along the equatorial line to be like a center of the world. It's like a very important energy kind of place, almost like the Egyptian pyramids. They are there for a reason. There's something about this place. And uh, it is really, really amazing the, the uh, geology of this place is, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, is some of some of these formations are not just the mountains, but they have like big holes in the middle. And inside this hole, picture a 500 meter deep hole, but huge, filled with different um, plants and animals and birds and things that, that some of them are just new to science. So the government and this Dr. Castillo, they just, um, Castaño, they just took a bunch of, uh, their first bunch of, um, researchers uh, back in the 90s and uh, and they have been going just by very little select groups to study this place which the idea is to keep it isolated from everybody definitely not tourism definitely just barely researchers because it's way too delicate and way too important to the point that uh, apparently the old indigenous that inhabited this place or at least the ones that made the first paintings, apparently wanted the rest of the indigenous cultures around the country or even around South America or the north of South America to understand this place is not for everybody. This place is, is a sacred place, so you're not coming in. So it is really, really interesting. One of these big rock formations with the hole inside is believed to be the cane of the sun god that was walking around and he just made a big <laughs> uh, impression in the soil, in the, in, in, in the, in the geology to, to show how he was getting married to mother earth. Well, all these things are just amazing. But the thing is that, uh, uh, I think it was uh, last year or two years ago, there was a, an article in the press talking about uh, the discovery of the 16th chapel of the Americas. They were re referring to Chiribiquete, but this Chiribiquete had been discovered many, many decades ago and has been studied, you know, long before that. So it was a little bit of a misunderstanding. Um, to call it the, Chiribi the, um, the, the Sistine Chapel of the Americas is a, a term that I understand how uh, it, it calls the attention to the press but archaeologists and anthropologists don't really like it because it is comparing to things that have nothing in common, nothing to do. The, the point is, however, uh, and this is very important, is that apparently Chiribiquete is being inhabited today by uncontacted tribes, tribes that voluntarily don't want to have anything to do with the outside world and who are still to this day preparing and using these um, wall faces for their own art. How do they know this? Two ways. One of the ways is that they have been looking at the pigments uh, that fall down to the base of the, of the walls. And they analyze uh, the, with carbon-14 technique, they analyze how old they are. And the youngest date of some of them is just from the 1960s. So imagine that. So maybe there are people there still working on their, on, on, on their art. The second reason they know is that before Chiribiquete became like a world sensation or you know, more, more known, very few little airplanes, you know, Cessna types would fly around because again, it's the only way you can really get from one place to the other. This is, think about it, more than 4 million Hectares is huge. Uh, so when these planes began flying, they would see they would see signals of of movement of of habitation. After that, lots of people or, or some planes uh, taking tourists uh, they would never land right, but they were just flying around. 
So Dr. Castaño noticed that there were no, signs of people just scurrying into the forest. I mean, they don't want to be seen. It's all very interesting. You never know, actually. Nobody has been contacted. But what is interesting is that some of these paintings have actually been dated to, to younger dates. So here we have this UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, with the oldest feline association anywhere in the world. I mean, people, you know, in Mexico, the Mayans and the, all these people, you know, all so many other cultures adore their god or the jaguar cats. But this place has the oldest representation and the oldest apparently, uh, yeah, homage paid to these animals, which is beautiful because there is a big jaguar corridor between Mexico and Brazil. And it goes right down the middle of Colombia. And so this corridor is being preserved or they try to make sure the, the animals have a link to traverse uh, from, 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 all these, from all these places down and up. Um, but so the bottom line is that here we are in the middle of one of the most amazing landscapes that, that one can conceive. Uh, incredible that uh, in the 21st century, there is still a, a place so virgin in the world and at the same time, so endangered and uh, fragile because the Amazon is a fragile uh, ecosystem. Um, in talking to Dr. Blanca Huertas, she's the uh, chief curator of butterflies in the Museum of Natural History in London. She's Colombian. I was just with her like a couple of months ago and she showed me a collection of butterflies. She said, look, this I collected in one single outing, uh, landing on a helicopter over the over one of these uh, tabletops. And uh, I know that every time the few scientists that have been able to go there, they bring in so many new species. So obviously that, uh, uh, you know, Colombia has always been an incredibly diverse, uh, uh, biodiverse nation even, well, actually right now it's ranking about I think, number one or two in most species. And this place, Chiriquete, pues not only has the most amazing archaeology, but the most incredible uh, biodiversity and the most threatened as well. So, so it's just so nice to share this with, with the people because again, this is like our Valley of the Kings without, without bodies. <laughs> it's a little bit like, for me, it's really like, like, like another barrier reef, like one of those iconic places that we just get to to uncover, we're just uncovering the lead of this thing for the first time. So it's like, wow. I myself haven't been able to go there, but there is a very interesting place right next to it. It's actually part of the same formation, but it is not part of the national park. It is neighboring, it is like a buffer zone, and it is called La Lindosa, and I'm writing it here. Why do I do this? Because this place has the same or a lot, of, a lot of the same rock art paintings, and you can actually visit it. So uh, I'm heading there in November, and it's been uh, deeply studied as well. And uh, it is the closest one can get to this amazing, amazing place. The Chiribiquete is, La Lindosa is in the, uh, next to the city of San Jose del Guaviare, in the department of Guaviare uh, in Colombia. Guaviare, here. So, so I, I, I don't know, we can now talk about that and so many other things we could ever talk about, but it is, it is really a pleasure for me to be able to share my insights as a, as a science journalist, as a Colombian American person who, you know, sometimes you have to be outside from your country to really get to value a lot of the things you don't see. Next year, we're having uh, the world, the, the, the national conference of the, actually the World Federation of Science Journalists conference, it's, it houses, it uh, gathers around the, over 1000 science and environment journalists, colleagues from all over the world. And uh, we're hosting it in Medellin and we're hoping uh, to be able to take a, a few of those journalists to La Lindosa to take a look at this incredible place. 
and it would be great to be able to, 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 to see how they show to the world what they have seen. So that's that. That is fascinating. Thank you so much, Angela. Wow. It just sounds like the most incredible place. And well, of course, I would love to get there. Um, so many questions. I, I'm just going to start by asking one, but please, if anyone has a question, put it in the chat and I can ask it on your behalf. Or if you want to take the floor, that's fine too. So can, can you tell us a little bit about the scale of the paintings and, and a bit more about how they were produced? I think I heard somewhere that these people, this tribe had to you know, sort of make some wooden structures or that there was some sort of, you know, quite involved process in painting these formations. I'd love yeah. to just get an image in my mind of, you know, how sort of tall and wide they are. Right. They, so some of them actually can only be seen by the helicopter if you want to be, if you want to see them at to eye level, because they, some of them are like, I don't know, uh, dozens of meters up there. Some of them are next to the base of the, of the cliffs. But uh, what I understand is that they really prepared the, 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 the walls as a painter who prepares his or her canvas. That's what's amazing. I, I think they um, actually uh, must have probably had some process of abrasion or ab abrasive or um, to make the rock wall even. And you can see that in the, in the pieces of rock that fall to the, to the base of the cliff. And so they made sure, I don't know if they treated them. That's part of what's being studied now, if, if the rocks have been treated with any other material. But the bottom line is that they really, that they really um, cleaned and made it more even so that there wouldn't be too many you know, uh, rock, uh, rock points that wouldn't allow the paintings to be made. Um, I think the pigments are uh, mineral, and if you see uh, some, it's mostly red, red that has become like ochre. Uh, and uh, what is interesting there is that, as Olive was mentioning, that there are different sizes of um, of paintings. So up above, uh, in the in the top part of the of the rocks you see the biggest paintings, they can be just, you know, I guess uh, you, 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 can, you can clearly see them with the naked eye. The animals, they're beautiful animals and, and rituals and people. And then the size of the figures begins to, 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 to get smaller and smaller until you get to the base of some of these rock formations. And at some point, if you're far away, you only see like a red blur and you think at first, oh, this is just like somebody just erased something or put red all over it. But if you get really close, you see that that red blur is actually tiny, tiny figures like mm -hmm. this. So it's interesting. It's as though maybe they had like a, a heaven kind of thing of important animals. And then perhaps the people underground or the people who, this is all being studied right now. It's like, like we're waking up to a new culture. That's what's the beauty of it. We're discovering a new thing. So yeah, this is all again. It's a, it's it, it, these are all theories, no hypotheses, but they make sense. Uh, apparently, they did made all these wooden structures to be able to climb on top and start painting. Um, and uh, and uh, and yeah, and uh, actually, another thing they did is that they made sure the cliffs they chose or, or even part of the preparation process were uh, protected against the elements, against the wind, especially against rain. So some of the, of the cliffs have this kind of little, kind of little bro, brows, no? So the paintings would be here protected by this, by this kind of little semi-ceiling of it. That's uh, well, very clever. And in other words, it, they were, the paintings were made to last. So even more of, of a reason to think of them as a ritualistic thing. I mean, they need to be like, almost like, yeah, let's make this as eternal as we can possibly make mm. them. 
Mm. One of the other things I wanted to ask you, you know, it seems like the paintings themselves are this amazing blend of sort of mythology and reality. And you mentioned yeah. these um, animals that are portrayed that are, you know, assumed to be prehistoric animals that are now extinct. I just wonder if there's any way of validating that if anyone's tried to, you know, if they've been sort of matched with the fossil record or has any work been done on that? They are right on uh, precisely right now as we speak, well, they are working on that very much. Uh, so with the Humboldt Institute in Colombia, and uh, and uh, that's yet they don't have anything definite yet, but definitely some of those animals look like uh, you know all the these all the South American big fauna like big uh, uh, giant armadillos and the giant uh, um, anteaters and all of those. Animals, but not only that, they had uh, river animals. They have apparently uh, pink dolphins or, or river dolphins, which we know uh, are there uh, in the in the rivers of that region. So they were there since before. But uh, there is definitely a, a, a share of old uh, South American extinct fauna. At least that's what the representations look like. And then they begin to morph and to become this 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 thing that uh, that you think are you know fantastical beasts uh, mm. and, uh, to merge with humans that's what it's it's a mix of things so in other words this is a a school these rocks are a school of not just biology and uh, botanics but uh, archaeology uh, religion shamanism culture it, it's the whole canvas there to be studied and is there anything in particular that it tells us about their culture, you know, their sort of rituals, you know, whether they, I don't know, danced or had festivals? What does it tell us about how they lived? Apparently, so far, the little that they have there to, to, really, to really see uh, or, or to, to conclude, they cannot conclude anything. But yes, there were uh, lots, lots of little gatherings and some little men in, in, in tight knots and some of them um, like in processions and some of them like swimming so I think it also depicts their their real life mm. in a way you know they're they're yes um so so that much you you, you can tell uh they are showing the reality of life apparently what they what they ate what they hunted what they hunt but also what what they believed in I guess no it's hard mm. to venture anything in something so new that there is a book out there just uh, just published by dr castaño carlos okay. castaño it's called chiribiquete just like that no uh, it's called uh, actually it's a beautiful name chiribiquete uh, la maloca del jaguar i'm going to explain you uh, maloca this this if you open the chat you will see maloca, it is an indigenous term widely used in, in many tribes in Colombia, at least and probably other places, to signify the, the house where the, in, the important house where the, the tribes would meet. Uh, you know, if there's something to be decided, everybody has to go to the maloca because this is where the chiefs are and where they tell you things. Or, so they call it the Jaguar's Maloca. So this is like the house, the main house of the Jaguar. Uh, and the Jaguar was, you know, like the, 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 big, the big god, uh, the mm -hmm. originator of everything. And so it's deeply connected with, this, with these other figures, you know, that we, we still don't know that much. I know the, um, there is going to be more news about Chiribiquete coming out next year. They haven't told me what it is all about, but they have interesting things to share with the world. So it should be. Uh, and what do we know about the tribes who are there now? You mentioned that there is a tribe there now that purposefully wants to remain isolated. Um, are they descendants of the people who painted those rocks? Do we know apparently, anything about that? Apparently, this is what they can surmise, these uncontacted tribes that uh, vo voluntarily decided to be isolated. And uh, let's see how much they can really continue to be isolated. That's the idea is to protect them. They would be very probably be descendants or be related 
to these people. But you see, if you look at the art in other places of Colombia, if you really study it, you see traces of some of the same art concept of, of figures you find in Chiribiquetes. This is why uh, anthropologists believe that Chiribiquete was the originator, uh, also given the age of the paintings of, of a lot of the tribes that we see in the territory. And that is beautiful. It's like the, the, the great, great, great grandparents. Mm -hmm. So yes, it, it makes sense that the people who are there, if they are in contact, with them, apparently they are, according to Dr. Castaño, and other experts say that they would be, you know, people who remained. I mean, it is still fascinating to me. I can't believe it. I can't get my head, my, my head wrapped around that concept. No, can you? Yeah, yes. I know. I, I also, I'd love to know a little bit more about um, just the fact that, you know, you said it was discovered a long time ago, although the press hadn't reported it that way, that it was originally discovered yeah. a long time ago, but that it was really off limits. Yeah. Exactly. So then that changed, obviously, I guess, with the, you know, change in the situation around FARC rebels and all that sort of stuff. Can you just tell us yeah. about that when it was first discovered and when it became more accessible to the biologists and the scientists who are now going in there and observing it and collecting well, all these butterflies? In a way, it's such a big part of the country that it, it was people knew it existed no but you never heard or read or saw anything about it uh, but according mm -hmm. to, to experts you know people knew about it for for decades and decades and decades i mean 60 years more but dr carlos castaño uh, at, at some point he was uh, the the chief of the national parks in colombia or right before that i can't remember exactly his timeline but 30 years ago or 35 years ago he was uh, flying on, on a small plane uh, just to get to another part of the Amazon. And there was a storm mm. uh, in the city where he had to land. And so they had to like divert the plane to a place that he would never fly over it. And so he begins to see this, these things for himself. And he himself discovered that. He said, oh, my God, I've got to do something about this. What the hell? This is incredible. So this is when he began pressuring the, the, the system and the government and, and telling them we need to make this into a national park. And they did, and then he managed to convince them to widen it. And again, in 2018, they really made it uh, a bigger place. So he is really like the, uh, the pioneer in that sense of uh, really saying we need to study it and we need to preserve this. And he's the one who took the very first group of researchers back in the 90s. And then, uh, you know, some, some few privileged uh, people other than researchers, uh, I think actually Prince Charles was invited to just go there and stand uh, in one of these places because of course he is an environmentalist. And so President Santos took him there and apparently he was uh, flabbergasted. So. Uh, but yeah, it is, it's just hard to believe that such a big amount of land can go like on the to, to millions of people, no? And yet again, probably, you know, the, 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 the armed groups decided this was their haven because of course nobody was going to get them. And ironically, in many parts of the Amazon and in other places of Colombia where they held their territories, well, it was for them, it was um, advantageous to have the cover of the forest, of course, mm. for them to be able to. So they protected up to a certain extent, but then without those people there, then it opened up for so many other people who uh, are just, uh, uh, yeah, deforesting and uh, ravaging, not just, not just around Chiribiquete, but everywhere else, no? Everywhere else, I mean, Chiriquete is a part, but when you look at Colombia, really, really, I would say 40% of that is like a forest. I mean, it's, a, it's, it's an amazing land. I'd love to ask you a little bit more about the protection and the threats, but I wonder, well, two things, if anyone else has a question that they want to ask, because I don't want to hog your time. Um, but also, you mentioned the, um, this short Vimeo, and I wonder, would you like to share that? 
the it was a short market. clip that you wanted to share oh yes let me just go ahead and tell me if you can see it we can see it yeah perfect thank you You see, look at those cliffs. The time has come to let the world in on a secret. A secret that has been guarded for tens of thousands of years. A secret that transcends our country's modern borders and blurs our understanding of the past. And that until now, remained the best kept secret in the world. Unknown to the rest of the world, and in fact to most in Colombia, Chiribiquete National Park is a place like no other on our planet. The crown jewel of Colombia's conservation efforts and a treasure trove of natural and cultural resources Chiribiquete is a place where life on our planet finds a sacred temple. A temple patrolled and protected by guardians, human and non, for millennia. Situated in the Colombian Amazon, in the states of Guaviare and Caquetá, Chiribiquete was declared National Park in 1989. Expanded once in 2013 and then again in 2018, to make it the largest natural park in Colombia and the largest tropical rainforest reserve in the world. With an astounding 17,000 square miles, an area slightly larger than Switzerland. The park sits in the center of our planet, quite literally. At zero degrees latitude, it is the confluence point of three biogeographical provinces. Orinoquia, Amazonia, and North Andes, and forms the westernmost edge of the Guiana Shield and the northern part of the Amazon Basin, considered by scientists as the most biodiverse area on the planet. GDP gets this isolation and inaccessibility have made possible this miracle of biodiversity. Only eight scientific expeditions have been made to GDP get this and each one has produced new species unknown to science. Its flora and fauna is indeed impressive. With 1,800 plant species, 410 bird species, 82 species of mammals, including large felines, 60 species of reptiles, 57 species of amphibians, 120 species of butterflies, and 60 species of fish, many of which are endemic. Its endless expanse of tropical rainforest also act as a gigantic carbon trap and a continental water filter, consisting of the drainage basins of the Masai, Nyare, San Jorge, and Amu rivers, and provides 60% of the surface water of the Colombian Amazon. Among its many treasures, Chiribiquete is unique for its Rocky Mountain Range. One of the oldest geological formations on our planet, dating from 1.8 billion years ago in the Precambrian period, predating even its neighbor, the mighty Andes Mountains. Composed of sandstone and formed mainly by water erosion, these colossal rock plateaus, called tepuis, can reach up to 900 meters above the rainforest canopy. It is on these sacred rock walls that our ancient secret is held. Cultural expressions passed on and on for generations of the Jaguar people, the original guardians of Chiribiquete. These ancient nomadic tribes of hunter-gatherers have been traveling vast parts of the Amazon beyond Colombia's modern borders for thousands of years. To this place, the center of the earth, the center of their universe. The name Chiribiquete translates to the house of the sun and the solar swarm. 
If one stands on top of these sacred mountains long enough, it's easy to see why. The Jaguar people believed this was the place where the sun and the moon had given birth to the Jaguar, the symbol of life and fertility, and entrusted it with the equilibrium of all living things. They saw in its markings the duality of light and dark, day and night. The Jaguar reigned supreme and was omnipresent. Permission had to be granted from the Jaguar to take from the forest. And so it is believed that these paintings were ritualistic in nature, offerings to a higher being in exchange for good fortune in the hunt and perhaps in war. To date, 63 rock walls with ancient drawings have been discovered, with about 70,000 drawings of humans, animals, plants, and their interactions. But this may only account for 10 or 20% of what exists in the park, crowning it the largest and oldest archaeological pictographic complex in the Americas. Carbon dating has revealed some of these pictograms are 20,000 years old, making them the oldest archaeological paintings on the continent. Even more impressive, some of these paintings appear to be from modern times, dating from 50 to 60 years ago. This suggests this sacred place was still in use by nomadic tribes and their rituals just decades ago, and perhaps still is. In the last few years, concrete evidence has surfaced that suggests the presence of several indigenous groups in voluntary isolation or who have never had contact with civilization living inside Chiribiquete National Park. This prolonged chronological context makes Chiribiquete perhaps the only place on our planet where a millenary cultural tradition has been maintained without interruption and the archaeological site with evidence of the earliest human activity in Colombia. It is no wonder then that UNESCO has declared Chiribiquete a natural and cultural world heritage site for its exceptional universal value, a title shared with only 38 other places on our planet. They say you can't protect what is unknown to you. That a society is defined not just by what it creates, but by what it refuses to destroy. And so, this secret is no longer ours alone. The house of the sun and the solar swarm may lie within our borders but it belongs to all of humanity. It is our duty now, as the new guardians of this planetary monument, to preserve and protect this legacy for as long as the Jaguar people have. For we are transient. But the legacy is not. Imagine that. Wasn't that lovely? Oh, that was just so incredible. Thank you. You know, it's amazing to hear about it and to think, I didn't know about this before. <laughs> Isn't it just, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Can you just tell me a little bit, you know, just for us, you know, here, what can we do to sort of support the preservation of a site like this? I mean, I know UNESCO has designated it, but, you know, what can everyday people do? I, that's a great question, Olive. I think as, as with other places, it's just understanding knowledge. Knowledge is power, I think. Really learning about it, learn the science about it, the conservation, the process that's going on. Okay. Because that again, yeah, the more we the more we learn, I mean, just as we learn to love the the, the coral reefs from a, from afar, also also these. And also Yes, why not? If you ever get to visit Colombia, uh, take a look at La Lindosa and this other, this this one place that is so close to, to the park. But I think for now, um, 
learning and, and disseminating what we know, just talking to yeah. others. Pretty much that's uh, you know what what we get to do, no, from, from, from our own corners of the world. Um and, and do we need to be worried that it's really under threat? We do. We yeah. do, and, and uh, it, it's just it's just uh, yeah, this desperating. Yeah, uh, I just I think I was just seeing it, I think I closed it, but uh, a two-month-old uh, publication about how, uh, I mean, thousands and thousands of, 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 of I don't know if it's hectares of, or square miles, have been already deforested in Chiribiquete, whether it is just because they want to give hell or whether it is because they want to put cattle on. This is incredible. That just shouldn't be. The thing is that, remember, this park is the size of Switzerland. So to actually... Absolutely. You know, uh, 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 yes, protect and make sure uh, uh, the lawlessness doesn't spread everywhere. It's, uh, it's like, uh, like impossible in a way, but we need to do that. We need to do that. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for a wonderful, fascinating talk, Angela. That was just amazing. And thank you all for attending. Um, let me also thank again the Embassy of Colombia here in Ireland and Dublin UNESCO City of Literature for supporting this event. If you've enjoyed this conversation, you can go on to the Cervantes Institute YouTube channel to watch more festival events. And um, you can also follow the Cervantes Institute on social media, and you can find out about lots of their other upcoming interesting events at www.dublin.cervantes.es. So thank you very much. RTE supporting the arts. Supporting artists. Supporting us.